Uh, good afternoon and welcome very much to the, warmly to this uh, webinar of the European Law Institute on its project on fundamental constitutional principles. Uh, it is very good that you have joined us and we have a very distinguished panel uh, to speak on the uh, subject. I will introduce each in turn just before they speak, but could I just say by way of introduction that, that it is carrying out uh, its projects under a broad um, series of umbrellas. And this one fits under the umbrella relating to the rule of law, uh, because it's, uh, the view has been taken uh, that this is an area with which we have to grapple and make certain that we promote a, a clear uh, uh, understanding. Uh, the, this project, uh, as uh, Professor Elise Muir will explain in a moment or two, covers a number of different principles. But it is intended not only to help those who are familiar with constitutional principles, um, but also to help those that are not, and also to show the particular matters we have to take care of. Um, many years ago in the UK, uh, a very well-known uh, Lord Chancellor warns of the dangers of an elective dictatorship. And one sees this re-emerging with, with some forms of populism. We also have an enormous competitor to the liberal democracies with the success of China. And we have to try and show that the liberal democracies and their principles are really models to be followed in the greater part of the world rather than the model set by um, China. And these therefore are very broad matters but absolutely suited to a think tank such as the European Law Institute that tries to produce and deal with the practical. But that's enough by way of introduction. And I'd like now to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Elise Muir, who's a professor at law at KU Leuven. Uh, she is a very well-known uh, constitutional lawyer, and it is a great pleasure that she has joined uh, Dimas, as one of the uh, reporters on this project. It's therefore opportune and right that we have the privilege of listening to her this afternoon. And I'm looking forward very much, and I'm sure you all are, to her presentation. Professor Mia. Yeah. Thank you very much for your um, very kind words, um, uh, Sir, Lord, uh, Sir um, Lord John Thomas. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. So thank you also to uh, the ELI um, uh, governance for inviting me to be part of this um, indeed uh, project. Perhaps by way of introduction, I, I shall um, start with a disclaimer. I'm, 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 I've been very recently brought in uh, as a core part of the project. Um, not that I was not aware of the project. I've, I've been working with Professor Tridimas for, for a long time. Um, um, but um, I think that any credits on what has been achieved really are not mine, has to be clear. If, if, I, if, if anything has to be uh, uh, directly connected to me, it's rather uh, what is going wrong with the project rather than what is going well. This is all the work of, of Takis, really. Um, so perhaps by way of, of introduction, um, I thought I would do two things in these few minutes that we have together. Uh, give a, a brief introduction to the project and then explain a bit more how I understand the, methodolo the methodological choices that were made to implement this project. So it is entitled uh, Fundamental Constitutional Principles. Uh, that's the title of the project. And our uh, purpose really, to start with, is to identify and articulate constitutional principles which form the foundations of European liberal, liberal democratic state. And perhaps one point to specify here is um, that there is a very strong desire on the side of, of the members of the team understood in the broad sense to look um, at all European states and not just those which are part of the European Union, and also to um, take European Union law as an important point of um, an, an important indicator of the existence of constitutional principles, but not as the only source. Uh, so perhaps that's just a little nuance to specify here. Um, the underlying premise of the project is that uh, such a liberal um, 
democracy, um, a liberal democratic state, is based on majority rule, but is constrained by the obligation to respect the rule of law, including fundamental human rights. So we are trying to build on this fundamental premise. Now, one of the first difficulties the group has had um, has been to identify sub themes, so main main topics which can constitute a subject which, which may constitute a co common constitutional principle. And so we have identified at this stage um, six of them, um, liberal democracy, the rule of law, the separation of powers, accountability, including ministerial responsibility. I have to raise my hand so that you can see. Um, number five, judicial protection, including judicial independence and judicial control and fundamental rights. Now, one of the observations we have already is that there is a level of overlap between them. Uh, nevertheless, we have deemed it useful until that stage, and I'm looking forward to your comments, and I guess Takis also is, um, but we've deemed it useful until now to treat them separately. Um, now, on uh, the first few ones, there is already quite uh, an advanced draft. Well, in particular, the one that was discussed last year, I believe, um, in the similar event last year with Professor Tridimas, was the, uh, the, the, the preliminary work that was done on judicial protection and more specifically uh, judicial independence. There is now a bit uh, more of a draft on the rule of law, liberal democracy. Um, again, these are temp tentative drafts at this stage. Um, uh, and I think Professor Tridimas after me will be uh, digging a little bit more in the, the work we're currently doing on liberal democracy, which is indeed something we're finding difficult to, uh, to articulate. So we look forward to, to your comments. Now, in terms of internal structure of the report, uh, the idea is to try to have uh, around 40 pages um, in total, articulated around the uh, principles, the main principles I just identified, the six of them, and under each heading to have a statement of definition explaining the general uh, and the salient attributes of the principle, then a sub another category with a sort of a, a sub, uh, like articulating sub principles within that predominant principle to be a bit more concrete. Um, and finally, uh, in a third stage for each of the six principles, a brief commentary with reference to, to the diversity of sources we've been using. Um, the time frame um, is, is the one that has been agreed with Eli. Um, we have it's, it's, a, it's a long process, and I think it's also related to the methodology. I'll come back to it. Uh, we will see how, how we progress in, in, the com, in the coming months. Now, uh, what I wanted to do in the second stage is to reflect a little bit more on the methodology that has been chosen. Um, I think it's something that has attracted attention within the group, outside of the group. Uh, so perhaps it deserves maybe further discussion. Um, as the master document makes it clear for those who have had access to it, um, the ambition of, I mean, the project is extremely ambitious, um, but it also is quite modest in the same time, I think. And, and I don't see how, um, how else it could be, but maybe you have other ideas. So first of all, it's ambitious because identifying common constitutional principles uh, to European constitutional structures is, is a very difficult exercise. Um, um, now, what we're trying to articulate in, in, in the document is uh, the tension between identifying general common constitutional principles, which is a central goal, but there is also a call, and I guess this is related to the nature of ELI and its mandate, there is also a call to make these uh, these general principles practically relevant, relevant to public authorities, courts, citizens. We are urged to provide a sort of concrete guidance to, to these actors. Um, well, the truth is, is it is difficult to find a common, uh, it's difficult to find a, a fair balance between identifying common principles on the one hand and making them easily usable uh, by the actors concerned. So I think that's that's that tension, that difficulty. Um, is something we, we bump into each, each single time we rediscuss the project, but it's, it's, I think it's also the beauty of the project. So it's, it's an ambitious project to identify principles, but it will be probably difficult to articulate in very much detail all the practical implementations of these common principles. So we're just trying to, to work on this. Um, 
there is also a tension in the methodology of the project between the descriptive and the prescriptive. Um, in a way we describe, we try to identify the existence of common principles. I think that's a key objective. Uh, in the same time, um, the, there is also the desire to make a statement, to make a statement of identity. And I think the, in, his, in his opening words, Lord John Thomas also made it, made it clear, there is a desire to assert certain values, uh, possibly to, so, so building on what exists, but also possibly uh, going a little bit beyond to a certain extent. Um, and there is a certain vision of what liberal democracy is about. So again, I think that um, this relationship between the descriptive and the prescriptive part of the project is at the core, I think will primarily be descriptive, but there may be a, a, a few preliminary assumptions on which we are a little bit more uh, uh, normative, I would say. Another point of methodology relates to the comparison. Um, I mean, how do we, how does one uh, identify the existence of common constitutional principles? One approach would be a, to, to make a very, very rigorous comparative legal analysis. Um, the difficulty with that is it's extremely uh, time consuming um, and, and technically ambitious. Uh, I mean, comparative analysis is, is just hugely challenging. So the proposal here um, in, in the, the way we proceed with the working group is to build on comparative analysis, but also to be to acknowledge that we are we have limits and personal limits in what we can do. Um, and in order to address these limits, well, we engage in deliberative processes. So the group is very open. We discuss a lot. We will um, op open the report to further deliberation and comments, as we are doing it now, but we intend to do it even more in the future. Um, so again, trying to address the challenge of this large scale exercise by uh, uh, finding a common thread with a group of experts, which is itself as open as possible. Um, and that combina this combination of sort of dilemmas, so the general principles versus the practical implementation, the descriptive versus the prescriptive, the, the, the scale of the comparative analysis um, versus the need to move forward. Um, I think this is leading us to, to this idea that what we're working towards really are soft guidelines. So a document on which a large number of experts can agree uh, after deliberation, that is itself, um, in fact, quite humble. It, 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 we hope it will provide a starting point for further discussion. So I think the modesty um, is not anything negative. It's just the best we can do is to provide a platform for further discussion and a common ground to build further discussion. Um, so I think this, uh, this is what I wanted to explain, that um, the, the, the methodological choices we're trying to, to deal with and this tension between being very ambitious, trying to identify common European constitutional principles, and at the same time acknowledging that we also have to be a bit modest if we want to achieve anything and then to enable further debate. So I think on this I will um, uh, conclude and I'm happy to give you the floor and answer any further questions uh, in the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, uh, that was an extremely powerful and very useful introduction uh, to what you're intending to do and the, and the important caveats uh, that you have added. Uh, it's now um, my pleasure to do two things. First, to remind you of, the, of what has been put in the chat, namely the thought-provoking <coughs> talk that you've just heard will no doubt have raised various questions do please remember that on this system, raising your hand doesn't work. You have to use the Q&A, but please use it. It's very simple indeed. We'll pick up the questions and we'll answer them when we get to the Q&A slot. Um, <clears throat> but now it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Tarkis Tridimas, uh, who is the chair of uh, constitutional and European law at the Dixon Poon School of Law at King's College, London. He is the co-rapporteur on this project and has put a tremendous amount of work like Professor Lee's into it. And I look forward therefore to hearing him talk about some of the principles in a little more detail. Professor Tridimas. 
Th th thank you very much, uh, Lord Thomas. It's um, a privilege and an honor to, to, to take part in this project. Um, uh, let me uh, say two words following on from what Elise said regarding the purpose and the methodology of the project. Uh, then I will say a couple of words about the principles that we include and then zoom into the principle of liberal democracy uh, and share with you our concerns, our challenges, our um, uh, um, uh, self-doubts, as it were. Uh, now, I, I think this is a, a, a project which matters. The issues that we uh, seek to uh, explore matter to the citizen. It is correct to say that enormous project has an enormous progress has been made since the Second World War towards uh, democratization of the political process. Uh, there is um, an increase, a proliferation of fundamental rights, but um, the project matters a great deal, and it matters a great deal for a number of reasons. First of all, because the greatest threat to democracy is complacency. Uh, secondly, it matters because um, political progress is by no means linear. A historical experience suggests that regression is possible. So uh, I think it is very important to keep those things in the forefront uh, of our minds, the need for democracy. Thirdly, it is important because there are new challenges to democracy. The, the rise of, uh, of, of private governance, digitalization, um, artificial intelligence, uh, new concerns like sustainability, environmental protection, which, which assert constitutional status, if you wish, uh, uh, I think make the project relevant. Uh, it, it is also um, important for the reason that Lord Thomas raised right at the beginning, that there are competitor uh, regimes. And uh, not only outside Europe, but what we uh, experience, at, at least at the very least, this is the common perception, what we have experienced in Europe in recent, uh, um, in the recent decade is a rise in illiberal democracy. Uh, so I think the, the project matters a, a great deal. The methodology, as Elise said, um, is not to follow a rigorous comparative law analysis of the uh, national constitutions that would not fit with the uh, uh, timetable, nor um, would it be possible to be done by a small team. So uh, it's a combination of description, but also prescription. What we are seeking to put forward is a set of principles which we think a, a liberal democratic regime should uh, abide by. Um, so what are we including in the project? Uh, we are including uh, liberal democracy, I think this is the starting point. We are including the rule of law. Uh, we are including judicial protection and judicial independence. Uh, we are including uh, uh, accountability. Um, we are including the separation of powers and we are also minded to uh, include uh, human dignity and equality. Uh, clearly, all these principles are interrelated. I, I, I think they, um, uh, they provide a system of governance, so they, uh, there is a, an overlap, um, but this overlap is inevitable because they express, a, a give effect in legal terms to a set of fundamental uh, political values, essentially. Um, let me um, say then a few uh, words about uh, liberal democracy. Uh, I think we are we understand liberal democracy really at three separate levels. Uh, it, it, it is an ideology, it is a system of governance, and it is political uh, culture. Uh, the third one, democracy as a political culture, is a bit more difficult to um, a, a, a tie into a, a legal te a text. Now, um, of course, there is ample dis discretion, discretion how to organize a liberal democratic state. Uh, one could choose a system of parliamentary democracy or presidential democracy. One could choose a monarch as a head of state. 
uh, there is um, a, 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 a variety of um, status statuses that the church may uh, occupy in a liberal democracy, but what we are looking is for the liberal minimum. Um, some core principles, uh, in, in other words, which represent the essence of a liberal democratic state and which cannot be departed from. Uh, these are majoritarianism, uh, uh, free and fair uh, elections, equality of citizens, uh, inclusive citizenship, a, a commitment to the rule of law, and a, a set of fundamental rights uh, which are legally safeguarded for the individual uh, and for minorities, uh, and which can even trump the wishes of the majority. So we view liberal democracy um, as having a dialogic character, if you, if you wish. The idea is that uh, all citizens uh, and a diverse range of interests should be represented in the political game. They should have the opportunity to take part in, in, in a, a, a political decision making. Um, uh, it is, in other words, an inclusive regime uh, uh, which does not follow a single orthodoxy, but which allows for uh, the participation and the representation of diverse interests. Um, now, I, I think it is correct to say that there has been considerable regression uh, in, in, um, uh, as to the degree to which liberal democratic standards uh, are followed uh, across Europe. Uh, we will provide some uh, examples of those. Um, and what I wanted to put forward really for, uh, for discussion is this. Uh, and, and these are, if you wish, are ambiguities, things that we, um, uh, we would very much welcome um, a commentary. Um, now, part of uh, a liberal uh, democracy is a, a, a free and fair elections. It, it comes to the definition of the electorate, if you wish, and the definition of citizenship. Uh, and of course, each state um, uh, has discretion in, in uh, deciding to whom citizenship should be granted. Uh, but we, we feel that there should be some restrictions um, on who can be included and also who can be excluded. Um, the, uh, this links, for example, but one, can, one can give some very basic examples here. Um, uh, citizenship is a privilege for the sovereign, uh, but it is still subject to fundamental rights. A, a law which would uh, provide, for example, that uh, foreigners can have citizenship of state X, uh, and if they are male, they can acquire that citizenship in three years, but if they're female, they can acquire that citizenship in 10 years, um, would appear to us to exceed the, the discretion that the state has, to give a very simple uh, example. Um, that, of course, can lead us to a more a, a nuanced discussion, a, a granting citizenship for economic benefit, which has been a trend that has developed in some European countries uh, in, in recent years. Um, uh, maybe this is something we would be inclined to make a comment about, um, e even though uh, there wouldn't be a uniform view uh, across the uh, European states uh, as to whether there should be any limits uh, or, or on the discretion of the state. The same with exclusion, for, uh, the same with, with um, exclusion uh, or, or inclusion or, or citizenship um, for example, in, in recent years, uh, some countries have extended electoral rights to ethnic minorities living outside the um, territory of the state with a view to helping the incumbent government. Uh, again, the analysis here has to be very nuanced. Context is everything. What may be perfectly appropriate in one polity 
may appear to test the limits of what is acceptable under the rule of law uh, in another polity. Um, second uh, area the, is respect for international law. Um, it, it links to the rule of law. Uh, is a respect for international commitments something we should include as an obligation flowing from the rule of law? The issue is by no means theoretical. Um, e, e, over the last year, there have been statements, for example, by the British government that they would be inclined uh, to, um, or they would even intend to, to, to breach international commitments um, uh, unless a certain political settlement uh, was reached in relation to the European Union. Is this something that we uh, might want to include? Um, uh, it is, after all, part of sovereignty and majoritarianism, the choice of the government to breach international uh, commitments. Um, if we, third issue, um, we take the view that there is a minimum set of fundamental rights that the majority cannot um, uh, trump, well, that then gives, I think, rise to two uh, other issues, again, very nuanced analysis, uh, uh, are we really saying that part of liberal democracy is a constitution that must be strict? In other words, um, uh, 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 do we want to make a statement that there are certain constitutional provisions which cannot be uh, uh, changed at all, um, the German approach? Uh, is this a necessary part of democracy. After all, no one would deny that the United Kingdom has a, a very advanced, fully functioning uh, democratic system, despite the absence of a, a written, let alone a strict constitution. A related question, um, related question, when we, we discuss, uh, when we have said that fundamental rights uh, must be respected, it does that also, what, what are the implications of this for judicial remedies? Are, are we really saying that a, in a democratic state, there has to be constitutionality review of legislation? There are, uh, um, a, a, as you know, many different ways of approaching this. A, one could have a system of dispersed judicial review as it occurs, for example, in the United States or in Greece where any court is essentially a constitutional court. Uh, one can have a, a, the, the other extreme, which is the a, a system of, of um, um, pa 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 parliamentary uh, omnipotence in the United Kingdom. Uh, one could have a system of a legislative override as it exists in, in, in Canada, uh, or a system um, uh, similar to that of the Human Rights Act in the United Kingdom where there is a declaration of incompatibility. In other words, to, to what extent are we prepared to constrain the majority um, in, the, uh, um, in, in our report? I, I think I will leave it here. Uh, I just thought it was worth zooming into specific questions um, in relation to, to liberal democracy, which is something that we are working on at the moment. Thank you very much for listening. We very much look forward to, to any comments. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Ridimus, for such a, a thought-provoking <coughs> summary of the main approach, and then going into detail to show how very difficult some of this is, the subtleties of the way in which uh, you can manipulate elections, or maybe not so subtle, have been so well demonstrated in the US. I think we have to be very careful as to finding means of ensuring that doesn't happen uh, in any of the European states. And, and we look forward very much to questions uh, or comments people may wish to make. And may I remind you uh, that, that the question and answer session um, box is open. So please do uh, put in questions for the panel, which, uh, which we will get to after the next two speakers. And now it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Pro um, professor uh, Renata Uit. She is the Professor of, of uh, Comparative Constitutional Law at the Central European University at Vienna. And I cannot think of anyone better qualified to speak 
on these really difficult subjects and what is important if we are to maintain uh, <coughs> the fundamental approach of Western Europe to our democratic way of life. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lord Thomas, and I would really like to thank the organizers for, for including me in this, in this conversation. It was a real pleasure to, to, to read the, the draft, and, and it was also very enlightening to, to hear from the rapporteurs about the, the work and also the consternations that, that form the, the project. Uh, I will make comments in, in order of, of, of the draft roughly following the, uh, the text. With, uh, with potentially some, some recommendations that, that do recognize the particular context in which the report will, will land. And, and here I, I, I would like to, to, to draw attention to the fact that this is a long process and where you started, the, the time and the context has even in the past few years changed radically and the stakes uh, have, been, have been raised even in, in this very summer when it comes to defending the foundations of, of the European public or, or constitutional order. Uh, the, the report at certain points does acknowledge uh, that most of the concepts it's dealing with, including liberal democracy, are, are contested, not in the academic sense, but also in the political sense. And, and this political contestation uh, actually has reached a point where, where it's on, on the way of, of, of contributing to a considerable epistemic shift that also does affect legal academia, legal intellectuals, and, and, and public intellectuals at, at large. The, the report at the moment vacillates or oscillates on, on, on whether, whether to, to speak about these challenges as sporadic occurrences or, or as a trend uh, of, of erosion that should be taken into account uh, as part of the, the general framework, both, both when it's an, analyzing a phenomenon and also when it's addressing a particular audience. I would actually urge the, the rapporteurs to, to, to be more straightforward when they see a trend and, uh, and, and do so not in order to, to shame those governments or states that are contributing to, to, to the erosion of constitutional democracy, but also to give credit to the European institutions, uh, including the European courts, which are actually trying to mobilize the existing components of the European public order in order to address this challenge. To give a, a stark example, which is not mentioned that in the report, Recently, the European Court of Human Rights started to, to activate Article 18, uh, which, is a, which is a clear sign of, of the awareness of, of the court, of, of the presence of abusive, abusive constitutional and human rights practices in, in the European public order. I would also think that, that being slightly more prescriptive and, and more open about trends uh, in the European public space, would bring awareness to, to European constitutional actors that, that if they let seemingly small issues slide, they end up facilitating constitutional and democratic backsliding uh, due, to, due to deference and, and sticking to, to concepts which, which do not mean the same uh, do, do not have the same, same meaning in the public space anymore. In the particular discussion of, of liberal democracy, uh, I was captivated by, by two elements in the report. And I'm really grateful to Professor Tridimas for, for, for elucidating what the report means uh, when, when it di discusses the, the bound, setting the, the boundaries of the polity. The particular discussions about citizenship and citizenship in, uh, for sale and concerns about electoral engineering are, are very specific. The, the language used in terms of the, the boundaries of the polity 
is, is much more general and currently could, could actually be read as if there was a strong favor for a unilateral definition of the boundaries of the quality without contestation and without acknowledging the, the diversity of, of, the, of, of these polities uh, and also without need for genuine political participation from those who disagree with the current definition of the boundaries. In this respect, I think the Venice Commission's advisory opinion on term limits, uh, on presidential term limits, which it provided to, to the Inter-American, uh, to the Organization of Inter-American States, is instructive in one respect. The Venice Commission opinion emphasizes the need for genuine political participation and genuine political choices uh, using comparative European and, and global examples. So resituating your discussion on the boundaries of the polity in, in, in the broader context of what other elements are, are made and without a strong emphasis on unilaterality in, in this respect would, would be very much welcome. Uh, another general comment has to do with the, in, in the manner in which the liberal democracy element is currently situated where there is a strong emphasis on, on majoritarian democracy tempered by rule of law and, and fundamental rights. I would like to, to probably see a, a stronger emphasis on, on constraints within constitutional system, it systems including checks and balances, including accountability structures, both legal and political participation. Because of the strategic choice of, of disconnecting these elements, it's extremely difficult for uh, a somewhat hesitant reader to see what liberal democracy has to do with constitutional accountability. And it's actually possible to read the report as if you were confirming that constitutional democracy is first and foremost a majoritarian endeavor. Uh, and it's a valid understanding without emphasizing constitutional constraint, it not only legal accountability and executive, execut executive accountability, but also robust transparency processes, including access to information uh, uh, and, and the like that, that then connect the rule of law with executive accountability and participatory dimensions and counter majoritarian elements uh, within the definition of, of, of liberal democracy. Uh, in, in response to Professor Tridimus's question about whether or not it is time to mention the UK government's um, suggestion that it's ready to breach international law, I think the broader context of the emphasis on constitutional identity in a number of, of, of member states in order, uh, in, in order to, to undermine the foundations of the European public order are, are extremely important. And one element which I didn't see emphasized in the report at the moment are the practices of disobeying national courts, not only by, uh, sorry, supranational courts, not only by member state governments, but also member state courts themselves. This is, I'm assuming, a feature that popped up relatively recently. And that's why, I, that's what I meant in the beginning that the project shifted or the space around the project shifted since it since it since its inception and last but least I'm, I'm fully aware that fundamental rights are not meant to be fleshed out in in detail in the report but my sense is that the current emphasis on on equality and dignity is missing the third point of what Susanna Bear uh, described as, as a triangle and that point is liberty at the moment, the equality and, and dignity focused discussion is almost apologetic. It's a very defensive discussion focusing on state intrusion. I don't see the active elements of human rights, those elements which make liberal democracy work, which provide individual agency for all those people who, who live in, in these settings um, and, and keep liberal democracy alive. I would, I would really like to pick up on, and this is my last comment, on your suggestion that this is a forward-looking document and that you, you hope to, to 
make it such that, that it can be the basis of, of a long conversation with diverse political actors. I would like to remind you that not all of these actors will actually be friends of liberal democracy, fundamental rights, and the rule of law. There are many academics and think tanks uh, where, where the ideas which you are describing and trying to defend uh, come under serious challenge. And some of these participants of these discussions will, will use this dialogue, not simply to shift the normative foundations within the European constitutional order, but also to challenge the epistemic foundations, which at the moment you are hoping to, to reconstruct. So these are my initial comments. I, I, I hope that I understood the aspirations of, of, of the report roughly as, as it was meant. Take whatever you think is, 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 is useful. And I, and I look forward to the discussion. Well, <clears throat> thank you very, very much indeed, Professor Renato Dean. Um, if I may just clarify one thing for those attending the webinar, uh, the professor has referred to, to a, a, a draft report. This is very, very much a preliminary draft of a report, which isn't yet uh, in circulation. Uh, and um, therefore, if you find it difficult um, if you wanted to ask, well, where is this document? I'm afraid it's not in a state. This project only just started and it's become very apparent uh, how complicated a subject it is. But I think what is very important in what Professor Renata Reed has said is uh, <clears throat> the need to try and make certain that we get the balance of all these different components of a liberal democracy right, because defending it as she says rightly, is going to be a real challenge. There are many enemies, even within Europe, of a proper constitutional form of government. And it could possibly be said that the fact that the UK, that the UK with a very long constitutional tradition, the government was prepared to breach one of the fundamentals of the, of the rule of law, which was to uh, repudiate a treaty, uh, is an, an illustration of the dangers to which we might be subject. And so I'd last turn to Professor a a Adam Bodnar, who's now a Dean of the SWS um, University, SWPS University at Warsaw. Um, he uh, uh, and is a professor of law. Before that, he was the uh, Commissioner for Human Rights of Poland from 2015 to 2021, and Vice President of the Helsinki Foundation of Human Rights from 2010 to 2015. And that foundation has played such an important part in human rights law. We therefore look very much forward to your comments, uh, Professor Bodmer. Uh, sir, uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this. Uh, to this panel to share some views regarding this uh, uh, project and this uh, paper under uh, preparation. Uh, when I was reading this project, I started to think uh, what is basically the, the purpose of it and why uh, do we need that kind of a systematic summary of values affiliated with a liberal democracy, uh, not only values, but also principles. And what came to my mind is basically Article 2 of the Treaty uh, on the European Union, which says about so-called European values. Uh, please note that quite often in the discourse in my country, in Poland, uh, uh, basically this point of uh, difference between Polish authorities and, uh, and the EU is basically to what extent should we comply, uh, should Poland comply with uh, so-called European values? Uh, and uh, even sometimes, you know, when I listen to uh, some major politicians, including uh, prime minister, they tend to define uh, those values as, I quote, so-called rule of law, for example. Uh, so, but I mentioned this because it seems to me that for sure there is a need for a further definition or further outlining of basically what is really inside Article 2 of the treaty. And as I understand, uh, this project aims at least partially to, uh, to do it, uh, just to give some guidance to decision makers, uh, to civil society, to member states, 
in order to understand what really the uh, what really should we define as being this part of this uh, let's say European consensus on uh, on uh, on values. Uh, when we do it, then the question is, okay, but who may really use it? And I see here a potential for using that kind of a, a report by uh, uh, those bodies that are uh, empowered, that are in fact tackling every day with uh, using uh, more comprehensive uh, definitions uh, of the rule of law, like for example, the European Commission, which is preparing the rule of law report, and we know well that there is a lot of discourse, what should be really inside this rule of law report and whether some issues are properly covered or uh, and what is the, whether the methodology which is made by the commission is uh, properly uh, prepared. Uh, and the second uh, major actor in my opinion is the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is uh, developing its case law and is trying to uh, let's look, for example, at uh, Article 7, which is the principle of effective legal protection, which just started from the case law of, uh, you know, let's say, uh, connection between, between right to remuneration for judges and the judicial independence. And right now, this whole concept embraces a lot of very specific, detailed uh, 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 issues. And most of them, in fact, are uh, summarized in this uh, uh, in this final chapter of this uh, of this report, but it seems to me that sometimes the uh, Court of Justice is a little bit alone in uh, in defining. You know, so what really uh, the court is under uh, is um, uh, what the court is defining as the basic element of some of those uh, standards, like the standards of uh, judicial independence. Suddenly, what happens, uh, and Professor Uitz has already mentioned this, is the extensive uh, growth of the uh, case law of the, uh, not only of the Court of Justice of the EU, but also of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and it's, uh, I know that this report is prepared over long, longer time, but it seems to me that last two years is not just a question of uh, Article 18 jurisprudence, but mostly Article 6 jurisprudence, uh, such case like Astratson, which defines quite clearly what should be the relationship between the executive power uh, and, the, mm, uh, and the judiciary in terms of judicial uh, uh, nominations. So we see here a, a huge uh, uh, and important dialogue between, uh, between both courts. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, the, the result of this dialogue is very much Fundamental to defining, to de, uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, defining what we really, really mean by, by some by different principles of uh, liberal uh, democracy. But uh, but I would like to uh, uh, add and to refer to some uh, specific uh, components of this of this report. So one of the statements which is included in the report is that this report does not aim to overlap with existing soft law documents. Uh, and especially Venice Commission is mentioned here. But, you know, I'm not particularly sure whether it is a good approach uh, because, uh, uh, because sometimes uh, you sh I think it is not needed to open the doors which are already open. Uh, like, I, in my opinion, one of the most advanced documents concerning rule of law uh, is the rule of law checklist by the Venice Commission. Uh, it is an extremely comprehensive, very well written uh, document. I think that, uh, as far as I remember, Marai Hunt from the Bingham Center was very much involved into shaping this, uh, this, this document. So maybe um, I think sometimes it is not needed just to create like another uh, or new definition in a situation when there is already a very much comprehensive document uh, defining some, uh, some of the concepts. Or maybe the purpose of that kind of a report should be just to build on, just to complement, just to add some uh, some new issues or some uh, new uh, ideas to, to 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 it. The second point I would like to mention is uh, the concept of liberal democracy, which is uh, in this report very much uh, is, is combined with the with the process of elections, and the, the report provides for that elections should be free and fair. Uh, and organized in a proper way. But here, I, I think we, we go to, 
uh, to one important component of elections, which is freedom of speech. You know, we are living in a continent where you have two EU member states uh, that are having a significant problem with freedom of media, freedom of speech aspect in the context of organization of elections. Quite recently, I have uh, published an article together with John Maureen uh, for Politico uh, saying that it should be the role of the European Union and also EU law to enter more strongly into this uh, dimension, into this area of, uh, of talking uh, that, uh, that it is not just a question for member states to decide, but that EU should have more competences or maybe it should use its own competences already. Like for example, uh, European Parliament elections in order to put more uh, pressure on member states in terms, uh, in terms of uh, free media. So in my opinion, this aspect of free media should be specifically mentioned in this part of, uh, in this part on the liberal democracy. When we are talking about uh, mm, uh, rule of law uh, and accountability, I would uh, suggest maybe sharing just one paragraph uh, on the need for uh, some level of independence of the prosecutor's office. Somehow, you know, prosecutor's office is not mentioned at all in this, in this report, although it should be. It is one of the major instruments of power these days in my country, uh, and just political dependency on the, of the prosecutor's office makes uh, sometimes protection of, of rights or, uh, or seeking for remedies almost uh, uh, unachievable, not mentioning enforcement of, uh, of judgments or lack of accountability of, of state organs. So I, I, I think it is, uh, it is quite uh, uh, important in this, uh, in this regard. And my, uh, and my last point, uh, and here I would, uh, I would like to, to come back to what, what Professor Uitz said, that no, I think this project aims towards uh, building something like a common framework for uh, Europe uh, in terms of understanding values. But in fact, uh, you know, when I would like to look into, let's say, the common values between, let's say, my country, Hungary, and let's say, Germany and uh, Netherlands uh, or UK, to be honest, I don't know whether we are speaking with the same voice. You know, I think that I still try to represent and a lot of Polish scholarship judges try to represent uh, this, uh, let's say, liberal thinking about democracy, but it is not any longer the voice of the major of, of some of the Polish major organs, like the Constitutional Court, uh, even uh, uh, some important judges from the Supreme Court, not mentioning the prime minister or the president of the republic. So, uh, and also what they do is not just that they have a different understanding. This understanding is, uh, is also equipped uh, or uh, is framed into the new constitutional language uh, proposed by the, uh, by the Constitutional Court, which is uh, heavily subordinated to the, um, uh, to the governmental uh, uh, expectations. So the question is, are we talking still about common constitutional standards or are we talking about the need to protect what is left uh, for the liberal democracy in Europe, and just to give some instruments to those who are still fighting for the protection of those basic liberal values. And if the second question is correct, then we should not just prepare a report, but we should also think what could be the effective value of this report in order to protect liberal democracy in countries like mine. Thank you very much. Professor um, um, Bodnar, thank you very much indeed for a, a very, very forceful uh, presentation again, following on that of Professor Uitz. Um, it, it is now a uh, particular value that you brought up little details, such as the independence of prosecutors. We talk a lot about judges, but people forget about how important it is that prosecutors are and how, and how it is so easy to use allegations and therefore prosecutions to silence critics. And so the independence of a prosecutor is absolutely central. But these are the value of this. Um, now, may I pose the first question and encourage others to make 
um, some to bring up some uh, questions if uh, they want to. And the first question comes from Oliver Gustenberg, which says, thank you for sharing these great ideas. Given threats posed by regression and regime competition, which you highlighted, I think the political culture aspect of your definition of liberal democracy is of particular interest. I think that's an important and under threat. Liberal political theory emphasizes the link between political legitimacy and mutual reason giving between citizens in morally divided societies. So consensus under such conditions focuses both on values and on processes, on ongoing self-provision, learning, openness to the other and to the future. That might matter for the question of identity and telos mentioned in your very illuminating presentations and add to why liberal democracy matters. Apologies for the off the cuff comment. Well, that's a very valuable comment and it would be very interesting uh, to ask um, any, ask uh, for observations on that. Can I ask you uh, first, uh, Professor Lise Muir, whether you would wish to comment on that and then I probably ask one of the others for their comments. And then I have a question for Professor uh, Trillimas. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Lord John Thomas, for, for giving me back the floor. Um, if I may use this opportunity to rebound a little bit to the various uh, thoughts and comments. Um, if, may I? Yeah. Um, of course. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Professor Oates and Professor uh, Bodnar for, for sharing your thoughts. I think it's very valuable to, to get an external view on, on uh, our work in progress, really. Um, what uh, your contributions uh, suggest and, and confirm is, is what uh, Professor Tridemas and myself already sensed is that it's, it's, it's a project that is inevitably quite uh, prescriptive, uh, but in the same time, to be a bit solid and credible, we have to build on a degree of descriptive work. No, I mean, so we, it's, it's really a very fine, um, a very delicate balance to find, but I, I hear the call for, for making a statement, a statement of identity. Um, but um, now a, a few follow-up remarks. Um, for example, Professor Bodnar, you have identified a multiplicity of important actors in contemporary European affairs. It's also what uh, Professor Oates was saying, the landscape in which the project uh, develops has evolved. And for example, we see the commission being much more active with its rule of law reports, the Court of Justice with its case law on Article 19 TEU, the CHR itself, the Venice Commission. I was also saying, thinking even the EU legislator uh, lately uh, with his rule of law conditionality. Um, so I think this plurality of sources in a way is very helpful to our projects, but uh, I think our concern is also to try to go, yeah, to go beyond, to build, and perhaps I can clarify, I think um, when you read from the report, Professor Bodner, that we do not mean to overlap with existing guidance, I don't think this was meant in any negative way. I think all, all we want to say is there may still be added value in continuing to build soft law documents uh, to further deepen and enlarge the debate. Um, so in that sense, I think we are, we are aware of the multiplicity of sources and not at all underlying or undermining uh, the value of existing rule of law checklists, for example. Um, it's really useful as well to hear your very specific remarks. Uh, so media pluralism, freedom of the press is something I think was on our mind already. Perhaps we had indeed under underestimated the importance of the role of uh, public prosecutors, but, but maybe Professor Tridimas will have different views. I, that hadn't come up in earlier discussions, so this is clearly something on which we should uh, further reflect. Um, and perhaps on this point of the tension between international law or case law from international or supreme, supranational courts and national courts and this argument of national constitutional identity, which you raised, Professor Oates. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's the difficulty and the beauty of this project, no? How do you flesh out common constitutional principles if the argument is that a constitutional principle is to be very conservative towards international commitments? Um, it's, it's, uh, the tension is this argument of constitutional identity encapsulates, no, the, if, if it challenges a pre-existing pre and vastly accepted set of international norms, uh, then how do you address this through, through the logic of common constitutional principles? It's, it's a really, uh, 
uh, difficult uh, conceptual exercise, but 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 we're working on it. Uh, many thanks for your comments and perhaps one last thought, but I, I know that Professor Tridimas uh, also maybe had reflected on that himself, is this idea of non-regression. I mean, it's something that came a few times in this discussion, is that we, you know, we don't know where we are going, but at least we don't want to continue regression. No, we, we, we want to stop regression and at least in order to perhaps be able to improve, but at least stop regression. Now, how do you define regression? It's, it's also really difficult. Um, so th there is this new case from the Court of Justice that says that after accession, a member state uh, shall not come back on, uh, you know, shall not regress in terms in particular of judicial independence. Um, so that's perhaps something to, to further uh, reflect upon, um, possibly even for judicial use uh, by, by, by supranational courts but um but again um, it's really difficult concept to you so it's just open for for discussion thank you for for your time thank you sorry before i turn to professor trinamas to ask him uh, um, to comment might i ask uh, Pro uh, professor bodner or professor weeds whether uh, they have any comments on the question that was asked No. Well, if you if 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 you don't mind me getting back to to the point which uh, which Professor Muir just raised about uh, what you do with constitutional identity and and how much pluralism uh, versus versus how much polarization. Uh, this is a this is a, a great debate with the added layer within the union about differentiation and, and the potential limits of differentiation. Then, then Kellerman has argued very forcefully that the rule of law is not differentiable, uh, simply because if you differentiate that, then everything falls apart. So the, plur the pluralism debate is, is very intimately tied to the differentiation debate, uh, where actually scholarship is also divided. And in a way, constitutional identity arguments and subsidiarity uh, comes almost to the rescue uh, because ultimately you can fall back on, on saying that you yield to national democratic processes and the outcomes of those processes. Uh, mind you, however, that within the liberal democracy element, there are plenty of pointers about how national democracies on the national level are compromised. And I think that something that the report could at least thematize is the action, uh, is the extent to which you can yield to national democratic processes on, in, in a subsidiarity framework uh, when you do know for a fact that due to the shortcomings of electoral systems, political participatory rights uh, or, or the distortion of the media market, domestic, political and constitutional processes are, 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 are deeply, deeply compromised. Uh, in terms of non-retrogression, it, it might be a, a very difficult not to crack because within the EU, uh, the Court of Justice is referring to, to commitments which, membership, which member states undertook at the moment of accession, whether there is a similar commitment to much more soft and fluid European constitutional values uh, will, will, will need to be tested and, and fleshed out, but I, I, clearly, I clearly see that there is a smaller club with more specific obligations here, and then there is a larger debate. Thanks. Now, I'm, I must turn now to Professor Trimas. We have about another five minutes, 10 minutes left. Uh, and um, there you've been, a number of points have been made. We don't have any more questions. And so if I can give you six, seven minutes to answer the various points that have been raised, I think it'd be very valuable for us all. Uh, th th thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, let me thank very much Professor Uitz and Professor Bodner uh, for the comments. I'll come back to them. On a couple of issues, I'd like to acknowledge the comment made by Professor Gestenberg. Uh, it is very valuable and it relates to the third aspect of liberal democracy that we discussed, i.e. democracy as a liberal 
um, as, as a political culture. And I think the, uh, the point is very well made. We will um, take it on. I uh, hasten to add that um, as part of this project, we would like to have as wide a consultation as possible once our report becomes uh, more elaborate. And indeed, I have already um, asked uh, Professor Gestenberg and, and a set of other colleagues to, to take part in, 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 in future consultations. So this is an open invitation. Uh, we will, we, to, to everybody present, we will uh, we really very, very highly value uh, input. Um, on the specific comments that um, uh, were made by the other panelists, um, I think they were extremely, again, extremely valuable. I think the, the point about prosecu prosecutors is, is uh, well made. We will take it on board. Uh, the issue about compliance with uh, um, judgments is also well made. We will, we will take it on board. Um, the uh, comment that Professor Bodner made about the Vienna, um, uh, the Venice Commission, and uh, the checklist, yes, uh, we will be seeking to, uh, of course, uh, and, uh, to endorse it, um, uh, not duplicate it, although some overlap I think is inevitable, but also uh, build upon it. Um, the issue about the commonality of these principles, again, Professor Bordner, raise the issue they're not we have now reached the stage where the evidence suggests that they're not in fact necessarily shared uh, I, I suppose my, my response to that is to say two things first of all if that is the case then as as elise said we would need to emphasize that the this the, the prescriptive component of the project but i would also say that well uh, member states of the European Union have a consented to Article 2. So I, I think they, they have consented to sharing them. If they don't uh, agree to them, uh, then that, that is highly problematic. But, but I can, the, the evidence, as it is represented in, in the dispositions of law, um, as a matter of positive law, is that they say they share those principles. Uh, uh, and, and what we are trying to do is extract content from them. Um, let me finally come to a, a, a point uh, made by Professor Uids, which I thought was extremely interesting. All comments were extremely interesting, but something that I hadn't really um, uh, thought specifically about, and this is the addition to um, a human dignity and equality of a principle of, of liberty. Um, and and I, I would like to know a bit more, more about this, how um, a Professor Uitz would conceive that, because liberty can be conceived in terms of a, a civil liberty, but it can also be conceived in terms of citizen empowerment, which includes economic and social rights. We are going to include a minimum of economic and social rights. This, this is something we have discussed in the group and we think that it is part of the uh, liberal minimum. But, uh, but I think that's an extremely interesting point. We, were, we hadn't thought of including it as, as a self-standing pillar. So uh, uh, any, any more comments um, that, that Professor Uitz might, might wish to share with us either now or at a later stage would again be extremely uh, extremely welcome. Um, I think that that's all I wanted to say at the moment, but I'm very happy to uh, react to further points. Professor Bodnar, was there anything briefly you wanted to say? We've got about another two minutes. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, to say that, uh, that thank you that some of my comments will be taken uh, into account. Uh, and um, and I think that uh, in this opening part, it would be important to just at least slightly indicate what could be the operational effect of this report. 
So that is the, the reason I mentioned, you know, the, the role of the Commission and the Court of Justice in shaping the, uh, the current understanding of the, of the rule of law. In my opinion, that kind of a statement might be a little bit like a guiding force for all those who are later on uh, drafting, let's say, uh, rule of law reports uh, or uh, opinions of AGs or uh, judgments of the Court of Justice. Thank you. Well, Professor Bondar, that last comment of yours, I think, will follow on from my comment just before we, uh, uh, I thank everyone. And that's to say, first of all, I think it's been invaluable for the progress of this report for the draft, the very much work in progress uh, that has been provided to, to Professor Bondar and Professor Weeks uh, <clears throat> to have this detailed criticism. It's much better that we look at it at, at an early stage. And I look forward to your contributions in the future. They've been penetrating and extremely valuable. Um, and secondly, I think that the point that has been raised is a point that is worrying Ely right across the board. And, and that is, how do we ensure that these very excellent reports when they're delivered, don't sit on a shelf gathering dust for some future historian to look at and say, why didn't someone do something about it? Uh, and this is an aspect to which we shall be doing our utmost. We regard the dissemination, the proselytization of these ideas as fundamental to the task Ely has. But before uh, <coughs> uh, concluding, may I just thank particularly the uh, Professor Tarkis and Trudemasa and Professor Elise Muir for the outstanding work they're doing. This is a very difficult subject. I think that this webinar has underlined the difficulty of doing something on so important and so comprehensive and yet somewhat elusive area. Can I again thank Professor Bodnar and Professor Weeps for their very uh, penetrating and useful comments. And can I thank the participants, those who've come along for their engagement. I hope they will continue to engage uh, with this project. And I'm sure that the two reporters will be delighted to have any comments upon it. And finally, can I thank the staff, uh, particularly uh, the <coughs> um, Vanessa for, um, the, our Secretary General uh, for all she's done in making certain this has run smoothly and run well. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you and good afternoon.